I'm available to start right tackle. You can't see when I close on. Right. No, there's not an even playing field. There's never been an even playing field. There never will be an even playing field. But <laughs> what shampoo do you use in your hair? You don't need to be Superman to play in this offense. You're listening to The Red Zone. Welcome, Badgers fans, to another episode of The Red Zone. I'm your host, Jason Galloway, with the Wisconsin State Journal. We are going to do a mailbag podcast today. We did these throughout the season last year, every Friday, and we're gonna we're planning on doing that again. But the Badgers start fall camp coming this week. On uh, first practice is Thursday. Uh, their media day is Wednesday, so it's it's time to get into gear here. And I, I've asked you guys for your questions already, and uh, so we're we're gonna get right into it. We got a lot of questions to get to. So uh, the first one is is John Meck at Bleed Badger Red. He asks, Is Zach Bond healthy? Uh, John, as, as far as we know, he is. You know, he had obviously he missed all of last season with a foot injury, and he's had some in, injury issues in the past, and that's that's kind of you know kept him from from sort of getting out there and kind of showing what he can do. Uh, you know, he's a guy that has a lot of potential. Who uh, a lot a lot of the coaching staff is very high on, um, but but he has he has suffered with a lot of injuries. But as of right now, it seems like he's healthy. I asked Paul Christ at, at Big Ten Media Days last week. Um, about that, whether he was going to be ready for camp, and he he thinks that, you know, Chris said that he expects Bond to be to be full go. You know, he he, you know, Bond kind of re-injured that foot during spring practice, and that's why that's why you're asking that question. I'm sure, John, that's why there's sort of a question about it. But um, it looks like he's going to be ready to go, and it's just a matter of, 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 of if he can stay healthy. You know, when when he did suffer that injury during spring, um, you know, before that he he had come straight into spring practice after missing a year and. And he was he was right away taking first team reps um, at outside linebacker. You know, obviously they're you know the Badgers are replacing Leon Jacobs and Garrett Dooley at that position. Um, I kind of thought going in maybe they would start um, Andrew Van Ginkle and Tyler Johnson as the first team guys and, and and see if Bond can work back into it and maybe maybe beat out Johnson for that other starting spot. But 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 they they put Bond in there with the first team right away uh, before he re injured that uh, that foot again and. Um, so I think that shows you just how, you know, kind of just how much they think of him. You know, Tyler Johnson, I thought, played really well in, in limited reps last year. Uh, and I really like what he can do. So as long as Bond can stay healthy, I think you could have a good player on your hands. It's just a matter of, you know, him kind of being able to stay on the field. And, and we can finally see what uh, what he can do this year. So as of right now, he's healthy. We'll we'll see if that, uh, if that holds up. Let's see. Brent Luplow at Brent Luplow asks, "What role do you think Scott Nelson plays this year?" Yeah, I, th- I think he's going to start. And uh, you know, Wisconsin's looking for a lot of new starters in the secondary. It seems like Nelson is the favorite right now to uh, to start alongside Dakota Dixon back there. Uh, I think they they've really liked Nelson since since he came uh, on campus last year. You know, he's a guy that got injured. Uh, during fall camp last year, and I, th- I think that he kind of fell behind a little bit in that respect. He was out for a while. By the time he came back and got up to speed, it was, you know, it was uh, it was October, November, and they thought it wasn't really worth burning his redshirt, even when Dakota Dixon was having some injury issues. Uh, but I think I think they kind of wanted to play him last year as a true freshman. When uh, later in the year, now there's a new redshirt rule this year where where guys can play in four games and still redshirt. And I I think if that was in effect last year, you would have seen Scott Nelson playing uh, some down the stretch. Uh, So I I think they're, they're really high on him. He looked good during spring practice. As of right now, I I would say Nelson is is probably going to start this year. Now we'll see how fall camp works out. I'm sure, you know, Patrick Johnson and Eric Burrell want, uh, you know, want to have a say in that and they want to try to beat Nelson out for, for a starting job. But um, right now, it looks like it looks like Nelson and Dixon are going to be the guys, and you know Nelson's the guy that Dixon really, you know, took under his wing last year. Nelson seemed to always be following him around everywhere. They, 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 you know, work together after practice pretty often. Um, so you know, I, I, I think they really like what they got there, and it's going to be interesting to see, you know, once he gets into real games, if he can, uh, if if he can do a really good job of replacing Natrell Jamerson, because that's now those are pretty big shoes to fill, and. Um, I think I think Nelson's going to be ready, but uh, we probably won't know exactly what they have in him until the until the actual game start. Let's see, biscuits at Whis Whisk Inferno. I think that's how you say that. Uh, he asks, difficult to not compare this offense to the 2010s, but what or to to the, to, to 2010s offense? Sorry, but what what do you make of uh, Garindo starting at tailback? Possible double jet sweeps 
with uh, with Aaron Crookshank and Jonathan Taylor in the backfield. <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I think Garindo is, uh, you know, he, he's a true freshman that's coming in. We haven't seen any, anything of him yet. He was not here during the spring. Uh, I expected him to start at receiver. That's kind of what everybody thought. But, I mean, they, they are, they're really deep at wide receiver right now, and they have a lot of great young players there. Um, so I think they want to try Garindo out at running back and see he's he's a speedster. You know, he's a guy that, um, you know, a guy that, uh, you know, is, is probably going to walk right in and be one of the fastest players on the team right away. I, I think maybe he's more of a project at, at running back, though. You know, I think we'll have to kind of see how he works in. I think there's still quite a bit of depth at running back this year. You know, behind Taylor, you have – you don't have anybody that, that, that wows you behind Taylor, but you do have guys that, that have made, you know, significant contributions. You know, you have – Chris James, Bradrick Shaw, Garrett Groshek. Um, you know, we, we'll have to wait and see if, if Taiwan Deal is able to, able to contribute anything after he's struggled with a lot of injuries. Uh, so I, I don't think you'll see him on the field this year unless they want to throw him out there for a couple games just to see um, kind of what he can do. With with the new retro rule now, it's, it it's kind of throws all this all this out the window. You just never know, uh, you know, which true freshman might get a game or two here and there uh, because you can still redshirt if you play up to four games. So... Um, I don't think he's going to really play a big role this year. I think they kind of want to see what he has. Um, you know, I, th- then again, I haven't really seen the guy play. I, you know, like I said, he wasn't here during the spring. Maybe he comes in as a freshman and and really surprises everybody. But I'm not really expecting that right now. Um, double jet sweeps, yeah, I, I think that you know, I I, <laughs> I don't think they're going to do anything like that. But uh, but it's good to see Wisconsin getting this kind of speed. You know, Crookshank is. Is a, is a fast player. Garindo's obviously got a ton of speed. Uh, Jonathan Taylor is is as big as he is, and as 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 great as a, of a power back he is too. He's got he's got some breakaway speed as well. Um, they, they got it. They're they're getting guys on offense that 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 have a lot of speed uh, and defense too. And you, you like to see that from uh, from this Wisconsin staff to go out and and recruit speed. And that's definitely what Garindo is. So I, I think long term he could definitely be a uh, a big threat. Uh, in, in in this Wisconsin offense, but I don't necessarily see Grindo doing a whole lot this season. Let's see, Akshaf at Akshaf. No, don't know if I'm saying that right either. But uh, uh, he asks three different questions that we'll try to try to get to here. Um, the first one is 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 Caden Lyle simply a backup to to Songapolu, or do I think he'll have a larger role? That kind of remains to be seen. You know, I, I kind of asked. You know, asked some questions of Chris uh, during Big Ten Media Days last week. Sort of, um, you know, if uh, j- just kind of poking around to see if you know could, could Bryce and you know Williams play some, some defensive ends. Could uh, um, kind of trying to get a feel for for how this defensive line is going to look after Lyle's moved. And I, I don't didn't really get a ton of straight answers. You know, I, I don't think uh, maybe that still remains to be seen from the team too. Maybe they're not sure exactly how they're going to uh, line everybody up yet. But but I. You know, I do think maybe maybe Delisles is a guy that that can play in nickel packages as well. You know, I think Songapolu, they, they kind of want to get him more in nickel packages as well, which is maybe that opens up some uh, some more time for Lyles to see a nose tackle and, and a base three four. If Songapolu is playing a lot of the nickel downs as well, uh, maybe that gives Lyles more of an opportunity to to actually get some playing time, even if Songapolu is healthy. Uh, you'd have to think that that Lyles, you know, regardless of uh, of anybody getting injured or anything else that he's going to play a role having you know switching him I mentioned this before on and some radio interviews but I don't think I've done it on a podcast but I think switching Lyles to to defense I I think it's I think it's a big move for them I mean uh you look at kind of what his prospects were as an offensive lineman and I, I know this might be a one-year move I'm kind of expecting him to to eventually go back to the offensive line uh but the kind of prospect he is on offense you know, even moving for a year, you're you're kind of taking him away from his development as an offensive lineman a little bit. He's not going to be out there, you know, practicing as an offensive lineman and things like that. And I think it's kind of a big decision for them to to move him to defense, even if it is only for one year. So um, I think he's definitely going to have a role. They're not going to just do that unless he's he's not going to be out there to to help them. I, I don't think at least. And uh, it, it's going to be kind of interesting to see how they how that works out because now they've got, you know. Uh, Sangapolo and Lyles at D tackle, and they still have a huge void at defensive end that uh, with Garrett Rand out and Isaiah Laudermilk potentially missing the first couple games of the season as well. So I, I think Lyles would definitely have a role. How, how they kind of work out, you know, what packages all those guys play. I think we hopefully we get a better idea of that um, over the next couple of weeks when we talk to 
Inoki Brechterfield. He, he's usually a little bit more, uh, Brechterfield's usually a little bit more revealing as far as kind of what his plans are for his guys uh, than maybe Paul Chris would be. So once we once we are able to talk to Brechterfield this week, maybe that uh, maybe things will be a little bit more clear then. Uh, let's see, a second question is, uh, nickel defense, whoever loses the cornerback starter competition or would they use Curran's or Johnson or Burrell? Um, that, you know, that's a good question. I, I think it, it kind of depends on how good they feel about these cornerbacks, I guess. I, I, I think they feel good enough about them where, where the, it will be a corner, a true cornerback there in the nickel spot. You know, they have Madison Cohn, Fayon Hicks, and, uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank here. Uh, Fayon Hicks and, uh, Caesar Williams. That's the other one. Caesar Williams, Fayon Hicks, and, uh, Madison Cohn kind of competing for that number two corner spot behind um, Dante Carey Williams. And I, I think they feel, you know, all three of those guys have really had their moments during practice, whether it was the spring or last year. Um, I still kind of think that, you know, they, they need to be a little bit more consistent. You know, you still kind of wonder if those guys are going to be able to go out there, as, you know, and, and take over an every down role. Uh, but I think they like the prospects of all three of those guys. And, you know, I, I think they feel good enough where, they would probably stick one of those guys as a nickel cornerback, um, whoever is the third guy. Um, I definitely think they could try Johnson or Burrell there. Um, I, I, you know, I haven't really seen them do that a whole lot during a spring practice, so I would, I would probably think that's, you know, that's not something they're going to do. But you, know, you never know. They, they, they it kind of depends on how these guys develop, right? I mean, if if they get through a couple weeks of fall camp and they're just not feeling as good about the cornerbacks as they thought they would. You know, maybe they, they try some different things there, but I would kind of expect it to be a true cornerback in that spot. Um, and then this third question, any true freshman playing on defense? I mentioned Bryson Williams earlier. I think that he, uh, I think there's a chance he has some kind of role. Um, you know, it's it, it, his kind of involvement is a little bit in question after, you know, Kane Lyles has moved to defensive tackle, but um Having said that, Paul Chris said at Big Ten Media Days that he he feels like Williams is you know kind of closer to playing. He, he, he's kind of working his way to being able to play sooner rather than later. Uh, and this is after the Lyles move that he said this. So uh, I I think that there's, there's still a, definitely a chance he plays a role as a freshman. I, I think there's like I said earlier with this new redshirt rule where guys can play up to four games and still redshirt. You kind of just never know when they might try to throw a guy in there and see what he's got if they have an injury here or there and they uh, they feel pretty good about a guy. So I, I think we could see a lot more freshman play this year, at least later in the season, or maybe they they try a, a guy or two um, in one of those first couple games against Western Kentucky or New Mexico just to see what they've got. Um, you know, Jack Sanborn's another guy at linebacker, inside linebacker. It's a really crowded position, and maybe, he, maybe next year is when he really takes on a bigger role, but I think they – I think he's, you know, he, he's a, he's a really good prospect, and um, that that fourth inside linebacker spot is still a little bit up for grabs. Uh, you know, after Edwards Connolly and Orr, you know, Mascal, Mike Mascalunas, uh, Griffin Grady, and then Sanborn will probably compete for that. Maybe maybe he's still a year away from from playing any kind of role, but he's a guy to maybe keep an eye on once fall camp starts to see if see if anything comes of that. Um, yeah, I can't really off the top of my head think of any other true freshman defensively that, that that might play. Oh, Isaiah Mullins is the other one at defensive end. Clearly they have a need there uh, with the Rand injury and Laudermilk being out. Um, I, you know, I think some coaches said during spring pra- practice that uh, they kind of, when, when Mullins comes in in the fall, they kind of, they're, they're going to give him some reps and they want to get a good look at him. They feel like maybe he's physically ready. They just have to see if they can, they can get him completely ready to play. But I, I think that's a guy to keep an eye on. Again, another person that we haven't seen yet was not here during the spring so we're not really sure what we're going to get out of that, but I think he's a, especially with the with being a defensive end and the need they have at that position. Uh, you know, I think you, uh, you know, I, I think you definitely have to look at him as a, as a potential guy that that could play this year. Okay, moving on here to Steve at SCX underscore two. He asked, "Do you think the defense takes a step back this year?" Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's. I think I'd be pretty surprised if it didn't take a step back. You know, I mean, when you look at having to replace seven starters, some of the, you know, issues they have at defensive end right now, and and having to replace three starters in the secondary, um, I think it. I think anyone would expect them to take a step back. Now, taking a step back doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be bad. 
you know, I think that they could take a step back and still be a really good defense. You know, that this is you know defense that's been legitimately one of the best in the country the last few years. So, you know, I, I don't expect them to. It, it's kind of hard to picture them being, you know, uh, top five in scoring defense, top ten in, in total defense yet again, um, like they were last year. But I, I do think they have a chance to be good still. You know, I, I, I like Scott Nelson as safety. <clears throat> At some of those corners, I, I think. It's still a question mark, but I think if, if one or two of them can kind of, like I said, become more consistent between now and the start of the season, I think that uh, I think that they they have the potential to work out. Uh, you know, they're still pretty young, but I think um, that there's definitely potential there, and, and, and maybe they're able to fulfill that uh, this year rather than later. Um, the defense of the def, you know defensive end is obviously the big question mark. Uh, but we'll we'll have to see how that plays out. I mean, I, I you can't go into a season with with no question marks on the entire team. So this is just a year where secondary and defensive line are kind of those two spots where you have to replace a lot of guys, and you just kind of have to see if if they can develop their their younger guys and um and, and kind of see. You know, back back in 2016, we thought that the secondary was was going to be pretty bad replacing three starters, and with the tough schedule they had, we thought they were going to be this team was going to be you know not much better than than 500 and they went out there and you know went uh almost won the Big 10 title and and came came pretty close to 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 a playoff spot and 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 you know guys we didn't expect to step up in the secondary did like Leo Musso and and Dakota Dixon and guys like that and you, you just sometimes you just don't really know what you're going to get out of these guys that you know may, maybe have a lot of potential but you haven't really seen in a real game so uh, I, I think I think the defense will take a step back, but you know, I, I still think they have potential to be a pretty good unit. Let's see. Pitts stop at son of a Pitts asked, did Lyles have a real choice on the move to defensive tackle? Uh, yeah, I think he did. You know, I mean, Paul Chris talked to Big Ten Media Days about how um, it was a situation where you know this this is a chance for Lyles to to kind of see the field this year. Um, you know, obviously at offensive line, he he would have definitely been on that number two unit, but it definitely would have taken an injury for, for him to see the field, and I think this way he actually gets to play a role and and fill a need on the team. And um, like I said, I think his long term future might, you know, is probably still at offensive line. But uh, I, from what I hear, I, th- I think Lyles, you know, kind of wanted the opportunity to get on the field, and it was a position of need for Wisconsin. So I, I, I definitely think Lyles had some some type of choice in it. Lucas Capistrant at L Capistrant one. I probably said that name wrong too. I apologize. Um, how likely is a cone redshirt if Alex doesn't get hurt? I think it makes sense to get him a good amount of snaps early and then give the cleanup work to Van and Boom or Wolf the rest of the year. Yeah, that that's a really good question. Again, w- with a new redshirt rule, we just don't know how teams are going to play this, right? I mean, I'm sure they would love to get Cone a redshirt year, uh, but Wolf is another guy that hasn't played either. Um, so if you play him more than four games. Um, you know, he wouldn't redshirt either, but I, I think I also think Vandenboom at this point would be ahead of Wolf. Now we haven't really seen Wolf, so we'll have to kind of, you know, as fall camp develops, it'll be interesting to watch Cohen and Vandenboom and Wolf and kind of see how those guys look. Um, you know, I, I I think there's definitely a possibility of a Cone redshirt. I, I I think I'd have to go back and look, but I believe Cone maybe played six games last year when they weren't weren't really worried about the four game rule. So I think it's, it may be pretty easy for them to, I may be off on that. It may be, it may be more than six actually now that I think about it, but I, I think they, it's, it's interesting to, I, I kind of think it might be backwards from what you're saying. I think, and I think if they're, if they're wanting to, to redshirt cone, they may give some of the early mop up duty to one of those other guys. And then if they, if they really need cone later in the season, um, you know, they, 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 say they could still play him for a few games if horny Brook got hurt. And, um, and still redshirt him, but uh, I knowing this coaching staff too, they may just say Cone is our our second best quarterback. We want him to be as ready as possible. Uh, you know, we we're not really too concerned with a redshirt if it happens, it happens. But but he's going to be our backup, and you know, we're up th- you know thirty five against Western Kentucky, and we're just we're just going to give Cone some snaps to to kind of get him some experience. So I I, I don't know I don't know how this coaching staff's going to play it honestly. Uh, it's it's a really interesting question when, with regards to Cone because you you have to think that a redshirt would be pretty beneficial for him to get one more year behind behind Hornybrook. So we'll have to wait and see. I mean, um, it's it's a pretty interesting situation with this new rule, and I don't think anyone truly knows 
you know, how this coaching staff is going to play it. So uh, I think I think that's something that maybe hopefully we can get answers on before the season actually starts over these next couple weeks of fall camp, but uh, we'll have to kind of wait and see. Let's see, Richard Carlson at RDK1212, he asks, the health of Neville and Shaw and what you expect them to be able to contribute this year, and how much does Rand's injury hurt, and who may be a surprise to replace them? So Neville and Shaw first, uh, I asked Chris at Big Ten Media Days last week kind of if they were going to be full go to start fall camp, and he said they, they they're going to have to be smart with them. You know, both those guys uh, – tore their ACL against Minnesota last year. Um, so it's, it's definitely a long recovery. You know, it's been, uh, it's been quite a while now and I'm sure they're close to getting back, but I think they're going to take those guys along slowly, um, and, and kind of, uh, be smart with them at fall camp and they'll kind of increase their workload as time goes on. But I don't have any indication that those guys are, um, are, are going to miss the first game or anything like that, but I think they're going to be pretty limited during fall camp, at least to, at least to start. Uh, now Neville is to me is a, is a lot bigger piece here. You know I think they really need his run blocking ability at, at tight end. I think he's um, he's sort of a, a little bit of an extension of that uh, of that great offensive line that they have coming back. And uh, I th- I think he did a lot for them last year in that regard. I think you kind of saw. I, I think his absence was 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 actually uh, really felt in the Big Ten championship game against Ohio State. They could have really used him and with the two. I mean the. Two, two of the two of the top guys behind Neville, uh, Kyle Penniston and Jake Ferguson, are still kind of working on that area of their game, and so you definitely want Neville to be healthy. Now Shaw, you you have other guys that can replace Shaw. I think you know I think obviously you you'd, you'd like for him to be healthy and, and ready to go, and but but I think with some of the other depth they have there at running back, uh, and Nakia Watson coming in as a true freshman, I think the coaching staff really likes him, and he's a guy that could that could take some of those reps too if Shaw's not back a hundred percent. But I think they're going to move. Shaw along slowly as well, and so I'll we'll have to kind of see where those two guys are at, how much work they do when when camp starts, and see if they're able to uh, uh, by the first game be a hundred percent. And then how much does Rand Rand's injury hurt? Um, who may be a su- surprise to replace him? Um, yeah, we talked about it a little bit already, but uh, you know I I think that you know with, with Laudermilk out as well, you're going to get a lot of. Um, a lot of young guys are going to get reps, you know, I mean, with both those guys out during practice, you're going to see these guys a lot and they're going to, they're going to have an opportunity to get ready. I think Aaron Vopel is a guy that impressed during spring practice that could end up uh, being with the first, probably with the first team unit uh, to start, to start fall camp. Uh, We talked about the true freshman Isaiah Mullins, who, who may factor in there. Keldrick Preston is another guy that I kind of like his potential. I've liked him for the last couple of years, but he hasn't put it all together yet, and maybe he can have a good fall camp and uh, and be able to get get some good playing time as well. And then it's sort of you know sort of the last the last hope for for guys like Craig Howe and, and David Foff, um, both juniors who haven't really got any meaningful game experience yet. This is their opportunity to to kind of show what they can do and to go out there and 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 and, and take some playing time. Uh, you know, this is this is sort of their opportunity as juniors now and to, to kind of win these guys injured to, to step up and, and show what they can, what they can do. So, so those guys will have to keep an eye on as well. Uh, let's see. Peter Gustav Swanson asks, uh, does Lyle's move to nose tackle help pave the way for Bryce Williams to contribute at defensive end? Okay. I actually did actually touch on that already. Um, you know, I, Chris said that was a possibility during media days, but it, he didn't really sound like, that was something that would definitely happen. So we'll have to wait and see what what they decide to do with that defensive line, and that that's going to be one of the that's going to be that defensive line is going definitely going to be, you know, probably the the biggest area to to watch during fall camp, just how they line those guys up and and who's running with the ones and the twos and things like that. Let's see, Ross Patterman at R E Patterman asks, I think we have a very deep O line, so I can understand the desire of any athlete to see the field. It will be interesting to see how. He develops playing in the opposite trench. I wonder what this move. Okay, never mind. That's actually the exact same question I just read. I should have uh, I should have looked at these more carefully before I started. <laughs> um, okay, this is this is a new question here. Uh, South Jersey Pete at S Jersey Pete. What is the likelihood Taiwan Deal gets meaningful snaps this season? Um, he actually has, he has a couple more questions. I'll get into after this one. But uh, you know, taking taking Deal first, I I think there's a you know. This is a tough one to to call. And you know, as of right now, I would probably bet on 
deal not really contributing all that much. Like I said, they do have a lot of depth at running back and, you know, he's been out for a while and he's, 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 I mean, he's got to be able to stay on the field first and foremost. And then he's got to beat out guys like, like Braddock Shaw and uh, Nakia Watson, the true freshman coming in. And, you know, Chris James maybe will, will take a little bit more of the third down work and passing down work. But um, I think it's, it's a pretty crowded room now. Maybe deal comes in and it's fine. It can stay healthy this fall and, and really impress everybody and, and get some carries. And I'm sure being, I think this is his senior year, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, maybe he will have some sort of minimal role regardless, but uh, I don't see him, uh, you know, as far as coming in and, and earning, saying earn, earning the number two job or something like that, I don't really foresee that for him, but uh, I'm rooting for him. I, I really like Taiwan, and, um, you know, I, th- I think he's a guy that uh, is, is has always worked really hard to get back and has just kind of been unlucky with some of these injuries. So uh, we'll have to kind of see how that plays out during fall camp. Um, and then you asked about a redshirt for Cone, which I already – uh, mentioned as well, so we'll go ahead and skip that. Um, let's see. The next question uh, was, who was the number two running back behind Taylor? I kind of already um, got into that, so we'll go to the next question from J Knox at J Noxy eighty two. He says, "I'll cut the crap." So he says, he says so a different word than crap, though. Uh, do we win the national championship? Put your reputation on it. Um, no, I, I don't. I don't think Wisconsin is going to win the national championship. Um, I, I think it's you know possible if everything breaks their way. You know, if if some of these young guys on defense really surprise people and are ahead of schedule and and they, they hit some of the right breaks and Hornybrook takes the next step and they get you know uh, they get the right matchup and uh, maybe in the semifinals uh, and and just everything breaks their way. You know, I I think they're I think they're capable, uh, but I, I think it's probably really unlikely. Um, I think that, you know, as of right now, I'm probably picking them to, to, to narrowly miss the playoffs again. You know, I think this is probably one of their best chances to do it. They, they do have a tough enough schedule now with Michigan and Penn state, um, uh, on the slate this year to where they can probably lose a game and, and still get in the playoffs that they won the big 10. I think the real question is going to be, you know, when they get to that Big Ten championship game, can can they can they win the big the big one there? You know, the last couple of years they've they've let it slip away. That Penn State game a couple of years ago was 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 really tragic, and then uh, and then the Ohio State game last year. You know that they had one drive to win it, and, and it didn't work out. So I think they they're going to be hungry if they get back there again to kind of avoid that third straight loss to one of the the East top top teams. It's going to be um, it's going to be a tough game when they get there. So I I don't know it's. I think you first have to talk about whether they're going to be able to win the Big Ten and make the playoffs. You know, I, th- I think you know asking if they're going to win a national championship is um, it's a little bit premature. I think when they haven't haven't made the playoffs yet. Um, now I think once you get in the playoffs, you know, I, I think anybody can win it at that point, even if they are say a big underdog to um, a number one seed in their first game. I, I think that if you get that far and you're one of the top four teams. Um, you, you definitely have a chance to win. So I, I think, I think their focus though is just about, you know, uh, it, let's win the if we can win the Big Ten and actually get into the dance, actually get into the playoffs, uh, then that gives us a chance. And I think that that's that's kind of what they're focused on. Um, I, I definitely would not bet on them winning a national championship. I think that's pretty unlikely still. But uh, I think they're definitely capable of getting in the playoffs. And at that point, um, who knows what could happen. Let's see. Michael A. Harms at M. A. Harms asks: Does Hornybrook build off his Orange Bowl success? Can he become more mobile to decrease sacks? Um, yeah, you know, I think that uh, I, I think I think Hornybrook can build off that performance. Now, I, I, don't, I don't think I think there's another person that's going to ask. I'll go ahead and address that now too. Uh, that's going to ask is is if is Hornybrook's Orange Bowl performance being a little bit overhyped? As in, you know, this is one game. Um, yeah, it was a great performance, but people are kind of saying, well, he can carry this into the next year. And, um, it, is that kind of overstating what, what happened in the orange bowl? And so I think you can look at it a couple of different ways. Now, I, I think you can build off that success and to see him go out there and, and play that well against a defense that, um, was, was great at forcing so many turnovers all year. That's, that was kind of Horny Brooks, uh, Achilles heel, I guess is, is kind of the decision-making and, and some of the turnovers he had. And he goes against, you know, a defense in that final game that, that 
that is was really good all year and had done a great job of forcing turnovers and he played a clean game and threw four touchdowns and no interceptions and I think that's a really encouraging sign uh, but I also think there is I, I do understand the you know some people saying well this is one game um, you know it doesn't really mean anything and I, I think I think both are kind of true I mean I you know it is one game and you have to kind of take it with a not with a grain of salt but I think you have to look at it from a big picture standpoint. It wasn't it wasn't Hornybrook's only good game of the year. You know he what he had you know great moments throughout the season. He had a couple really big moments against Michigan after starting that game slow. Um, you know a couple other games he he was really on point. And then he also had some games where uh, he made a couple head scratching decisions that that led to interceptions. So I think consistency is really the big thing for Hornybrook. I don't think you can just look at the Miami game and say oh look what he did against Miami. He's gonna walk right in this year and just uh, you know start start throwing you know three four touchdowns a game and and uh, be better be a better decision maker and, and not throw these interceptions. Uh, but I also think he's um, with another off season, uh, another year where he's spending extra time uh, working on his game outside of UW. Um, being a junior now, being a you know getting into his upperclassman years and having a lot of experience, I think all that could translate into. Um, a more seasoned player who who doesn't make the kind of mistakes he did last year, and I think if you really look at, I've said this before, I said it kind of throughout last year. If you if you look at Hornybrook's season and and just chops jo- chop a little bit off that interception total, I think it, his season looks a lot better than maybe a lot of people would like to like to believe. I think he had a really good season. He just had you know some moments where he he didn't make uh, some great decisions and they led to some bad interceptions. And you know I, I think if he can if he can kind of clean that up. Um. Then you know I think that uh, I think he could have a really big season. Okay, let's see. I think this is the last one here. Big Cat five nine six nine at Tyler Barisa. Probably said that name wrong as well. He asks, "Can you break down the left tackle position? And what are the characteristics of the players competing for the starting job? And who do you project as the starter?" Yeah, that's a good question because you know as much talk as there is about every offensive lineman coming back from last year for Wisconsin, uh, they are going to have a new starter still. Uh, with Michael Dieter, uh, it's looking like he's going to move back to left guard, and that opens a spot at left tackle for someone who who maybe maybe didn't play much last year. And I, I think the the big front runner right now is Cole Van Lannan. Um, he's a redshirt sophomore who is a uh, you know a big time recruit coming out of out of high school, and I think that they, they think they think he's ready to step in there at left tackle and, and play really well. He hasn't had a whole lot of playing time, you know. When when Neville went out last year, toward the end, they they did give Van Landen and Patrick Castle uh, a little, you know, a few snaps here and there as a sort of a blocking tight end, which was really interesting. Um, I think that you know they they kind of wanted to, um, if if they could get him a little bit of experience in that regard, and I think that you know we, we didn't get to see. Um, this offensive line in spring much because they had so many starters that sat out. And so it's going to be interesting to see when they line up the first, you know, the first day of fall camp, it, you know, can, it, assuming Dieter's at left tackle, uh, to, if we could confirm that the Van Landen's with that first team, I think that's what everybody's expecting. Now, um, there's been a lot of talk and, you know, the coaching staff and, and, and players too, you know, in, in the spring and, and throughout, to, uh, throughout media days last week, um, a lot of them were saying, you know, John Dietzen is going to be, you know, right in the thick of it, competing for that left tackle spot with Van Lannan. And I, you know, when that first came up in the spring, I think Joe Rudolph mentioned that Dietzen was competing at left tackle. Uh, kind of surprised me because it just didn't seem like he, uh, he would be a tackle. You know, he's played left guard throughout his career here. He has struggled with some injuries, and but when he's healthy, he's been a pretty good left guard. But it just doesn't seem like he had quite the body type uh, and maybe athleticism for for the tackle position, but. Uh, you know, I saw some quotes from media days saying that um, I think it was Michael Dieter that that said that you know he, when he's healthy he can he can move as well as anybody, and uh, it's it's just interesting to think that maybe maybe we really haven't seen a healthy Dietzen, um as often as we think we have. Uh, you know, maybe he's played through a lot more than we think, and uh, maybe maybe he's healthier after after an off season of rest, and um, maybe he's going to go out there and surprise people and and show that he can play tackle. Um, that's going to be something to keep an eye on, but but I think right now, Cole Van Lan is is your is your front runner, and uh, you know that's kind of the one guy on the offensive line to look at and and see if he can fulfill his potential. But I think they really like what they what they see from him, and they um, 
are expecting big things from him. So if you know, with with all those all the talent around him, with Dieter beside him at left guard, I think that could help him out as well. Uh, so we'll have to see if uh, if he can kind of complete the um, the offensive line and and make that group one of the best that we've we've seen at Wisconsin. All right, thanks for all the questions, guys. I really appreciate it. It's good to get back into it. Like I said, UW has its uh, local media day on Wednesday, and then they will start practice on Thursday. Uh, and we are going to start doing podcasts weekly here during fall camp. And then during the season, we'll go back to two a week where we have, you know, an interview with another beat writer um, earlier in the week. And then the, then the, then the mailbag like we did today on, on Fridays. Uh, so keep visiting madison.com for all your Badgers football coverage. And if you haven't yet subscribe to the red zone on iTunes or Google play. Thanks for listening.